What am I? Recording in progress. Okay, let me check the um, Facebook to make sure we are live. I think it's already running. It should be. I just want to double check, make sure everything's set to roll. Yep, we are live. All right, guys. Thank you for coming to another episode of Hollywood Kitchen. I'm sorry we're late, but it will be worth the wait because today I am reunited with my friend Daryl Rooney. He is a Gene Harlow expert. He is the co-author of Harlow and Hollywood, The Bombshell and the Glamour Capital. And Sorry, with Mark Vieira. With Mark Vieira. And we are going to talk about his book, his incredible memorabilia collection, Harlow Food. We're going to talk about all things Harlow. So if you love Gene Harlow, you are in luck. Today is really going to be a treat. Speaking of. Speaking of. Now, this book originally came out in 2011 on Gene's right. 100th birthday. And then this is an expanded edition. This is an updated edition. It's I wouldn't describe edition. it as expanded oh, okay. because we couldn't add more pages. Okay. We could just take what was there, anything that is new that's happened in the last 10, 11 years. Uh, we updated uh, uh, things, changed captions, swapped some pictures out for uh, rarer images, brought things like uh, contracts and telegrams and put them in the book. So oh, that wow. means that you should own both copies of the book. That's right. And this is going to be a real treasure trove for yes. fans of Gene Harlow. And you'll be able to tell that this is the updated version. There is a gold medallion in the bottom right corner that says update. And it's a hardcover book, no dust jacket. And the image that used to be on the dust jacket is now on the hardcover. Excellent. Front and back. Well, we're gonna dive all plot. we're gonna dive all into this book and preview some of yes. these things in this book. But first off, because I do have some people who watch Hollywood Kitchen and are new to the world of classic Hollywood, Daryl, give us a one-on-one. If you were to meet someone who landed on another planet and had never heard of Gene Harlow, how would you describe Gene Harlow to a newcomer to classic Hollywood? Well, the easy way that I always describe it is she is the original platinum blonde. And she was Marilyn Monroe's idol. That's who Marilyn Monroe wanted to be as a movie star. And that's who she got to become. She experienced the, the good and the bad of it. That is true. And I find that her movies are still every bit as vibrant, every bit as funny as they were in the 1930s. They really do not seem to date themselves. Yeah, she just seems endlessly contemporary. And, you know, and Marilyn does too. Absolutely. So they do have a lot in common, and we are going to get into that. We're going to get into so many things. Let's see. Oh, let's let's eat. have coffee. Let's have coffee. Yes. By the way, I do want to mention there is a coffee brand called Breakfast with Dominique's, and they have an entire line of classic Hollywood coffees. And I've been corresponding with them. We thought it'd be a fun tie in. So they sent me the Jean Harlow chocolate caramel coffee. So today, you and I will be drinking that coffee here on camera, and we will give our two cents on it. I've already had a couple of cups this morning, and I can't say it's delicious, and my entire apartment smells like chocolate caramel coffee, which is... Yes. And by the way, we are very much adhering to 1930s today, so I am in a 30s house dress. Daryl's house is from the 1930s. As are all of the dishes. This house is from 1933, built-ins so on either side. Yes, we are keeping it real today. The Hollywood dishes Kitchen. are all 1930s, Art Deco. There we go. All right, shall we kick off this episode with a bit of a coffee uh, toast to Ms. Harlow? I'm going to move this out of the way. I usually have bigger mugs in my hand than these. No problem. Jean. To Jean. <laughs> to Jean. Mm. Okay, that's good. That's so my good. new favorite coffee. Yes. Because I don't really like coffee. I always have to disguise it. So make it chocolate, make it hazelnut, anything. This will work really yeah, well. Yeah, this really is excellent. And I love coffee. So my love of coffee is very sincere. So that's why. Coffee and classic movies are indeed a great taste that tastes great together. <laughs> so in researching um, about I think a year to two years ago, time is very fuzzy in my head right now, but 
you and I did an episode, Jean Harlow's Hot Rolls. And that was during the lockdown. That was during lockdown. And it was so funny because I literally live 15 minutes door to door from you. And to not be able to be in person and to be on Zoom yeah. was so weird. And then I showed up on your lawn with hot rolls after it was. <laughs> and they were fantastic. And it was awesome. So what I've done, um, I've done some research. And by the way, thank you to Crystal Lawler if she's watching because she really helped with this. We found a lot more Jean Harlow recipes. So well, I think there is a lot well, more Harlow. Let's do more in the Let's future. do more. We, there's plenty more there this came from. But since it's still roughly in the 90s here in Los Angeles weather-wise, we decided a cold yes. appetizer would be a good thing. And the two recipes we found today, they're from Milady's Food and Fashion Parade cookbooks. These were cookbooks that came out in the 30s. And basically, they had star recipes, but also fashion spreads. So you would see, and by the way, these are printouts that you made for me because yeah. my original cookbooks, if you pick them up, they crumble everywhere. They're very fragile. But you see the full outfit of Harlow in this picture and in this one. And then you see the recipe. So it's kind of a playing to both the food and fashion crowd. And I'm sure these were very popular in the 30s. So there's two recipes that we decided would be great for a hot summer afternoon. The first one is the orange and tomato salad for the popular hostess. Now it says here, one would always be a popular hostess if she wore a gown like this. Mm -hmm. I think we can agree on that. This taken from Jean Harlow's personal wardrobe. It is of white suede crepe and features long flowy lines, double sleeves, and a cord and braid trimming. Not good for cooking it. Not good for cooking it. This is true. Then it says the orange and tomato salad. Now we're going to kind of talk about how we're going to wing this one just a little bit. Okay, we're going to reduce it because it does say six tomatoes. We're going to go with like two just because it's just two of us. So we're going to take our tomatoes. Let's see. Ah, okay, here's our preparation plates. This is where we wing it. This is where we wing it. The uh, cutting board. Yeah, I'm going to use the cutting board. So it says to boil and the tomatoes. Going to move the flour. It says to wash them, remove the skin and stem. So we remove the skin and stem and we boil the tomatoes. And the, a funny thing happened. One tomato, every single bit of skin flew off immediately. The other one, not at all. Yeah, so I just want to preempt because uh, you said, oh, I don't know how to get the skin off. And I'm like, oh, you know what? Corsu Collins told me. You boil water, you drop the tomatoes in, you leave them in for mm, the time period that I don't remember. So we winged it. One, the skin just came right off. Like immediately. immediately. The other one, not so much. Not at So all. I think it means that they should be in the water for a minute because we had them in for about 30 seconds. This is true. This depending is on true. the size of your tomatoes. Now it says make five or six cuts in tomatoes very neatly in the base, beginning at the stem. Based on the description of this recipe, I think what they want you to do is make it like a flower blossom kind of thing. So. I'm going to be the assistant. Okay. I'm going to guess it. These need to be flipped. So they want. Right. Do you want to cut it first and then put it on the lettuce after? Yes. Now I'm confused when it says make five or six cuts in tomatoes very neatly to the base. Are they? I would imagine cuts that's or just a to the base so that it will fold out. That's fold what out. that means to me. Okay. I think you're going to need the larger knife. I need, I need a bigger boat. And okay. maybe make six since it might be okay. easier to do. Okay. Hopefully I get this right. So far, so good. Okay, there's one cut. Two. Three. Four. That's enough. Okay, yeah. I think that's kind of a nice little tomato blossom, if you will. Mm -hmm. Nice. I'll try it with this one. My hands are clean, by the way, so don't worry about that. It's actually trickier to cut this, the one where the skin came off because it's it's very slippery. Oh, right? okay. Yeah, it's very, very slippery. Try my best. And it's kind of falling apart, too. Mm -hmm. uh, Oh well. Oh, well, oddly enough, the one that was uh, with the skin still on it is easier to cut. Okay. 
place tomatoes on lettuce leaves. All right, so we will. So do you want to put them on a plate? Let's put them on a plate. Okay, place tomatoes on lettuce leaves. We'll do that. Uh-oh, <laughs> it's falling yeah. apart on me. Okay, oh, on lettuce looks leaves. so beautiful. Okay, now place tomatoes on lettuce leaves and bend back division formed yep, by cutting that. to represent flower petals. We did that. Peel oranges. Oh, you know what? Let me stop. Maybe what it means is to that you don't cut all the way down. You cut it sort of like halfway place and then finish cutting it so it opens uh, up. Okay. Peel oranges, divide into sections, place one section between each flower petal. Okay. I peeled these as best I could. I know mm -hmm. they're a little rough, but we have the oranges that we already pre-peeled off camera. So we're going to put these in the middle of all of the... <laughs> <laughs> Mine is going to look like a four-year-old made it, and I'm really yeah. sorry I did the best I could. I think Jean would understand. Okay. And then, all right, add onion to mayonnaise. So you take, um, it doesn't say how much mayonnaise, it just says add onion to mayonnaise, place in one section between each, okay. And place onion to mayonnaise and place in center of flour. All right, so I think we'll each take a dollop of mayonnaise because it doesn't go into detail about that. Okay. Okay. All right, we'll add onion to mayonnaise and place in center of flour. So here's our onion. Take a little bit of that. Place in the center of our orange and tomato flour. Okay. And voila, we have Jean Harlow's 1930s orange and tomato salad. Great. Bring it up close to the screen. Yes. Imagine it as a nicely shaped flower. Yes. That will take some practice. And I assume too that this would have been a great thing for a summer garden party. It's almost like a finger food. You just kind of grab it or you take a little toothpick or a little fork or something. Oh, in that case, we would want to make sure that the tomato is cut all the way through. And I need yes. a fork, I think. Yeah, a fork. Let's see if I can cut it into pieces. Okay. Is it easy to cut? Um, well, that piece was. Yours should be because yours boiled and the skin mm -hmm. came off. Mine might be a lot more firm and difficult to maneuver here. Let's see. Let me... Nice. Very light. Very nice. Okay. Very cool. All right. Now, the next thing we're going to make is also a 1930s harder recipe. Stuffed celery a la shrimp. Now this one does not oddly enough give a description of her outfit at the top, which is kind of a bummer, but you can see she's got this gorgeous black gown on in the photograph. I know it's black and gold thread and um, it has, um, oh God, I'm terrible describing things. Um, a braided rope belt. That's an excellent way to put it, of uh, black and gold. There, that's Was as this much shot as I at Bullock's Wilshire? I'm no, kind of, this no, is, no, this is her okay. living room. This is her living room. Oh, wow. Okay. So, this particular item that we are going to make, let's see. Okay. Are we cutting? We don't need this. Uh, no, we don't need that part. We can uh, set that part aside. Okay, so we shredded one cup of shrimp. And Cora Sue Collins, we love her so much. And while she's not on the episode with us today, she is in spirit. And we actually used her food processor to cut the celery mm -hmm. and the shrimp. All right. So we've got one cup of shredded shrimp. I got the small shrimp from the grocery store and we put it in a food processor. Okay. So one cup of shrimp mixed with one fourth cup of minced celery. So let's mix these two together. And did the same thing, put it in the uh, little food processor. Put it in a food processor. Okay. Oh. I need a bigger bowl to mix this in actually. Mm. But if one's available, if not, no big deal. Well, I believe we have one that's of the same style. Perfect. Mm. 
Look at these Ooh. Art Deco bowls that I bought in England back in 1991. This might actually be the first time I've ever used this. Excellent. Well, I can think of no better reason to use no it tennis. than a Jean Harlow food episode. So it was just waiting for the right opportunity to come along. All right, so we're gonna mix our celery and mix our shrimp in this stunning Art Deco bowl, as one does. Okay. And then it says, add two tablespoons of mayonnaise and stuff stalks of celery with this mixture. Okay. I take two tablespoons of mayonnaise. This is roughly two. Mm -hmm. It's good to me. All right, I'm gonna stir this all up nicely here. Oranges up here. See. I'm saving my plate over there for the final. Oh, I see. Okay. Shot. And, uh, Never mind. Okay, so the mayonnaise kind of serves as a binding agent to bind the shrimp and the celery kind of all together here. All right, and now we're just gonna stuff the stalks with it as she says to do. So I'm gonna take this and just kind of line these celery stalks up with the mixture. Well, I guess some stalks are gonna accept more mixture than others. I think it depends on how. And maybe a fork might work. A fork might work, that. yes. You can grab your fork. Excellent. But here's what it looks like. Okay, yes, that will be the right tool for the job. Okay, so I'm gonna mash it down a little bit as well. So that way it kind of stays in the stock. Oh, here we go. A little bit better. Ah, oh, perfect. So they, here, I'll hold it. Can yes. You give me the celery. Oh yeah, let me put the celery on here. We're just winging this today. <laughs> we are. Okay, right. so now while I'm putting the celery in here, I want to say that uh, Krista and I, while researching this episode, we found the Harlow hot roll when we did a long time ago. I found a Harlow beet recipe. I found a Harlow cream puff recipe, mm -hmm. and I found a Harlow meat cottage pie recipe. So that's just some of the stuff. Oh, and I found a chocolate cake too. So I think we might even have a cooking with Harlow spin off at this point that might be needed. But Jean, it just kind of shows you how popular she was that you find this many recipes because mm -hmm. obviously people wanted to know what Jean Harlow's cooking, what she's wearing, where she's going, and what she's doing. Well, you know, and most often, uh, movie stars are considered people who don't actually cook. Exactly. Jean Harlow actually did cook. She didn't learn from her mother because they had servants when they were mm -hmm. younger, so her mother didn't know how to cook. Wow. But she went to um, Hollywood School for Girls. She went to Fairy Hall, and she learned how to cook, so she was actually a very adept cook. Wow, that's interesting to know. Now, you were telling me she did have a cook. I believe his name was Prudence? Prentice. 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 Okay. Tell me about Prentice. Was what do you know about him and well, his role in Harlow's uh, household? That, I actually I don't know anything. I just know that he was the cook that they had. Uh, the only pictures I've got are nineteen thirty two, and um, when she went back east, he continued to look after the house so that when uh, mail arrived that had to be signed for, it was actually signed by Prentice. Oh wow! It's not very much that I know, but I do know that much. Okay. So getting into, we're almost done with the celery here. So mm -hmm. getting into our, our deep dive discussion of Harlow, when you were researching Harlow, which you've done for many, many, many mm -hmm. years, what stuff was the most surprising stuff that you had found out? Like what really surprised you and you didn't know? Uh, you know what I have to say is that there's always a question of who was Jean Harlow? You know, mm -hmm. there's terrible books that have been written about her that um, really paint a really ugly portrait of this woman. Uh, and that's sort of the person that we grew up with. If you read the book in the 60s, if you saw the movies in the 60s, you know, it's it's a sex crazed, sex starved woman who- Vulgar, profane. Yes, uh, you know, who sleeps around and has a dismal end. And, um, I just, none of that ever rung true to me. Um, and I think I, just in my gut, you know, I would look at pictures of her, which to me, tell me who she is. You know, just this radiant, radiant woman. And I just, I don't, I just, 
I don't believe this stuff. I, I think there's something else going on. And um, so in all the research I've done, I think the thing that was most, most profound was to find out about her early life. And I have to say that the, all of this research was done by someone else, Dennis Lee Cleven, and I, it would be wonderful if he's watching. Dennis Lee Cleven wanted to write a book on Jane Harlow back in the 1980s. He reached out in newspapers and magazines and found people who had grown up with her and interviewed them all. And, um, and so I there's just these endless interviews, uh, anecdotal things that happened, what they thought of her at the time, how friendly they were, how they felt about her mother. And when I understood who that young girl was and the world that she grew up in, everything in her adult life made sense to me. Wow. So I feel like I can tell when something's not true because that's it's just something she would not do. Definitely. When I first learned about Harlow, and when I was in college, I got a paperback book by Irving Strollman about Harlow. And this is way before the internet. It's like, you know, mid-90s. Mm -hmm. And I read it, and it was awful. And I complained to my film history teacher that I'd read this book, and it was terrible, and I hated it. And he said, well, let me give you a good book. And he handed me Bombshell, The Life and Death of Jean Harlow by David Stead. And that was a huge education for me in what a trashy, horrible film history book could be, and what a brilliant and scholarly and well-researched film history book could be. It was like yeah. day and night. And then after that, I was like, wow, I was right. That first book was trash. The second one, she's a human being. And it was really, it was just night and day difference. Yes. And I was fascinated with her. And then you've done so much work on her as well with all of the stuff that you do and Harlow and Hollywood. And it's just so great to realize that she was a person. She wasn't just a sex symbol, just a movie star, just a kind of a lightning rod, you know, in, in pop yeah. culture. And so tell me about the process of doing the book on her that you did. You know, actually, the one thing I want to add to what you've just said before I answer that question is I think the price tag of being a sex symbol is that you could talk trash. People talk crap about you. Yeah. Terrible books are written. Terrible horrible, movies. Horrible, horrible movies get made. Mm -hmm. And they still get made. Yep, yep. There's one out this week, which... Mm -hmm uh is um fictional yes so um it's the price tag of being a sex symbol people are going to write fantasy crap about you none of it's true don't buy that stuff um you know and uh david sten was my mentor and um he taught me about research and he taught me that my opinion is irrelevant doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what are the facts? What are the facts telling you? And that's what he did with his book. He didn't have an idea. He didn't have a thesis. He just wanted to know what really happened to this girl. So much mythology about the way she died. And he went to the facts, found the facts. So now it's all out there. And you know what's interesting? When my grandmother was alive, this has been years ago, we were, I was telling her about some of the classic Hollywood stars I loved. And she was a little girl when Jean died. And she loved Jean. And she said, you know, I always wondered what happened to her. I go, what do you mean? She goes, well, I asked my mother when I was a little girl, how did she die? And I was told I was too young to know about that sort of thing. <laughs> and I was like, really? So I gave her David's uh, bombshell book. And she told me she read the whole thing in one sitting. And she was blown away. Because yeah. she didn't know as a little girl in 1937. It was this secret, this lie, this horrible thing that she was not allowed to hear about. So I think for her to finally learn the truth was really eye-opening. Just goes to show the, the gossip and rumors that were going around back then. And it's really unfair because, as I say on my cemetery tour, these people might have been movie stars and sex symbols, but they were people. And they deserve the truth. They deserve yes. to be looked at as human beings and not just, you know, as these inhuman you know, objects really. So I'm so glad that I know so many historians who are dedicated to telling that truth. And I think that there's such an amazing power in just watching the films. That's what I tell people, I always say, you know, ignore sometimes some of the stuff that's out there, watch the movies. Because it is amazing. I've been lucky enough to be at like Turner Classic Movies when they show a Harlow film on the big screen. And it is incredible. It like brings the house down to see redheaded woman in a mm -hmm. crowded theater 
filled with film fans. It yeah. is just an experience. Well, you know, and what's wonderful, if you can see a variety of them, you know, see Redheaded Woman, which is a comedy, see Bombshell, which is a comedy, Dinner at Eight, which I'm going to describe as a comedy drama. Then you see Red Dust, which is just a drama. And she is equally as powerful as Clark Gable. Uh, Wife versus Secretary, where she plays a refined secretary and holds her own. And one thing that fascinates me about Harlow and a lot of Hollywood stars is the transformation of their image. Because when we first start discovering Harlow's work, she's kind of got real hard features. And there's something kind of crass about her, but you still really like her. And then she morphs so much when she does Redheaded Woman. Not only the hair, but the comic touch. The It's like a totally different person. Yeah. And then she morphs again when she's more platinum blonde. And then after the code came in, she's brownette. And not just in her looks does she change, but the kind of roles she plays. Even the kind of dresses she wears. I think they went from Adrian to, to Dolly Tree, right? Mm -hmm. So they yeah. started dressing her differently. So she kind of morphs and evolves throughout the years. There's almost so many different phases of Jean. And it just makes you kind of long for what she could have done had she not died of kidney failure at 26. What she could have, like, what do you think? I mean, I know it's kind of pointless to speculate what might have been, but what do you think could have happened potentially had she gone on? Oh, she would have had Lucille Ball's career. You know, okay. she Lucy had the career that Jean Harlow would have had. You know, after Jean Harlow dies, Lucy does these, a series of movies called Annabelle, Who's a movie star? Annabelle takes a tour, and I forget what the other one is called. And it's kind of loosely Bombshell, the movie Bombshell, just redone. But uh, you know, Lucy picks up where Jean Harlow left off, and then she does other things. She does dramas, finds her forte in physical comedy in the late '40s that brings her to I Love Lucy. I think that Jean Harlow would have probably done film noirs in the '40s. Oh, you she imagine? Yeah, and she would have. She would have been huge with the USO because she was very democratic, very Amer pro American. Mm -hmm. um, in the 50s, I'm sure she would have done television. I'm yeah. sure she would have done big movies, playing the mother of uh, to a, you know, a whole cast of new stars, but I'm, I'm sure she would have had her own TV show. Oh, yeah. The sky was really the limit for her. I mean, there were so many plans in the works. And when she, when she died, that you're right, I think that's absolutely the trajectory. Her career would have followed. Yeah. So I don't know about you, but I am really eager to see the book. Oh. Can we okay. see the book? Well, let's move some food out yes. of the way. Oh, so that you don't Should mix. we try these on camera though? Well, yes. I feel like we need to try these on camera. Mm. These are great. Mm. This is a really good light summer food. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're going to have to eat all that. I know. You know, I was thinking, we Not had a little bit of trouble with the food processor, which is why the show is a few moments late. I'm thinking this might be good on like a, a pita bread or like a lettuce wrap. You could almost make a sandwich mm -hmm. or like a salad bowl out of the rest of this. Which That's maybe, a great idea. Maybe we should do it. It doesn't have to be celery at all. It doesn't, no. And this was so easy to do. So mm -hmm. definitely. Okay. Okay. Well, let me take one more bite. Okay. Very good. Mm. Do you need an apple? Mm. Oops, now you do. <laughs> mm. okay. okay, let's make some room here. Okay. So this is an advanced copy of the book. It is um, in the works, it is getting shipped from Canada where it was being printed uh, as we speak and should be arriving mid-October. I can't give you a date because, you know, shipping is sort of up in the air these days. And my friends from Larry Edmonds Bookstore in Hollywood, which, by the way, those guys could not be more supportive of the film history community in Los Angeles and elsewhere, honestly. And they told me this morning that they are gonna have copies on pre-order on their website. Yes, yes. And uh, every uh, book that you order from Larry Edmonds will also be autographed. 
So if you want it uh, specifically autographed to you, you will tell them what it is that you want written in it and Mark Vieira and I will sign the books accordingly. Excellent. So let's get a preview. Let's get a preview. I'm so excited. Well, first of all, I'm, you know, uh, hard cover, no dust jacket. And you just got this like yesterday. Like this, this is fresh yes. off the press. And it's so white and it's so clean. Okay. And I have to say the printing <laughs> is magnificent. I'm going to wash all the shrimp okay. off my hands. I'm going to sort of turn and just, it's just, it's just so crisp. You want to hold clean. it up to the camera so people can get a real. Uh, here, well, I'm going to start Ooh. on this page because this is one of the firsts. Oh, my This goodness. is. A 1937 natural color photograph of Jean Harlow shot by James Doolittle. Um, and this was in an April 1937 photographic exhibition, which is how I got, got the photograph. Uh, it has been digitally enhanced by uh, Victor Mascaro from Hollywood Stars in Color, who I've been working with for over 20 years. And he has removed the 80 years from it so that it's um, natural color. It's, uh, you know, it's, it doesn't have age marks on it anymore. Uh, sharpened it here and there with the, you know, digital magic. I, I don't know how to describe it. It's pretty uh, amazing what they can do these days. It's not technology. altered, it is just enhanced. And I, I hope you guys get to see this in person because I can't explain how beautiful in Let's person how big I can get. these colors are. It's magnificent. So throughout the book, there are a bunch of new images. There are things that you have never seen before, like one of her Howard Hughes contracts. Um, and Howard Hughes exploited her, right? He charged theaters a huge amount of money and paid her very little and basically bought her or gave her money to buy clothes. Is that well, is right? that exploiting or is that just good business? If you're having you know, this, but then... he took a nobody and made her a star. Okay, okay, fair enough. And the price tag is, you know, he got a lot of money for her. Okay. All right. Fair uh, but, enough. You know, in the way that he didn't treat her well was there was no follow-up movie. Yeah. That's the big problem. Uh, you know, she did Hell's Angels, she's on the world stage, she's hugely popular, and there's no next film. So um, she turned to Paul Byrne at MGM, who was a friend, and he convinced Howard Hughes to put her in The Secret Six, and then he saw, oh, I can make $1,000 a week off of her by loaning her out. And so that's how those six or eight movies happened in 1931 and uh, early 1932. Okay. So... Throughout the book, there will be new images like, I'm going to go closer to the camera. This is one of the uh, addendums to her 1929 contract. Every six months, she would get $50 a week more. It started at $100. Six months later, $150, $200, dollars He's charging between $1,000 and $2,000 for her services per week. She's still getting $150, $200. So a good deal for him. She needed to get free of him because he wasn't going to put her in another movie. She was, you know, she was just eventually going to slip into oblivion. Yeah. So things like this, I just thought were really valuable for everyone to have a, a, a copy of. And they tell a story as much Absolutely. as a photo does. Yeah. So another one, another thing. So she goes to... Uh, New York and Chicago at the end of December in 1931 with a six month um, deal at the Oriental Theater in Chicago to do a personal appearance tour. Six weeks, did I say six months? I meant six weeks. Six weeks turns into three months of going all over the Northeast and uh, um, the reaction from audiences is spectacular. And with that happening, Paul Byrne is behind the scenes at MGM trying to get her into MGM. And the proof is she's got to be popular. Well, she is popular enough that MGM says, okay, we have redheaded woman. She has this amazing comic timing that has never really been seen on film. Yeah. And uh, with the tests that were done, she looks like she's a home run. So uh, on March 3rd, 1937, 
Howard Hughes agrees to sell her contract to MGM and she's called up and told that's what's going to happen. And then Howard Hughes sends this telegram to his CEO, Noah Dietrich, saying, sell her contract for $30,000. This is a good deal. So I'm going to get close, even though it's, I guess it's probably backwards on Zoom, right? So um, well, sure. you'll have to buy the book to see it. Sorry. So this is the actual telegram that Noah Dietrich got. It was like, wow. okay, sell it. And the funny thing is, uh, Howard Hughes always said that he sold a contract for $60,000. Wow. And the truth is, it was only 30, which is still an incredible amount of money. This is the depression. Yeah, but, that's uh, huge. You know, salesman, Howard Hughes was always a salesman. That is true. Uh, one of the other things that I'm go going to point, point out is that all of the full page black and white photos, I'm going to go to one. Well, I'll use this one. Every single one of the uh, full page black and white images, Mark Vieira, who has just really mastered digital photography, digital printing, and how to work with uh, publishers. All of these photographs were redone and just the tone of these things, the, the multitude of tones is just really remarkable. So it's another reason to really get the book. All these pictures are, are spectacular. I have to give Mark a shout out because I co-authored a book called Hollywood Celebrates the Holidays a few years ago with Mary Mallory. And a lot of the photos we had for the book were 80, 90, 100 years old. And they had cracks, they had chips, they had flaws, which is fine in real life, but not for publication. Yeah. And Mark cleaned those up for us. And we worked with him on that. So he is truly a master. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And he studied with George Harrell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it doesn't and get better, better than, than that. that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's see. I'm going to show you a couple of other things. Oh, yeah, isn't this amazing? The no. camera loved her, and I know that's a cliche you hear people say a lot, but in her case, it is absolutely true. She has one of those camera faces, any yeah. angle, almost any angle. Same thing with Marilyn Monroe. You know, I, I, oh, yeah. I took those two pictures and, and posted did, them, uh, which will somehow get on this we'll get page. on this page. Uh, and they both just had these, the way their faces move, just remarkable. Also, another connection with Marilyn is Ben Lyons, because it, yes. he was in Hell's Angels with Harlow. And I believe he was instrumental in discovering Marilyn at Fox. So I think he obviously had an eye for talent and could spot these women and their potential. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to jump towards the back. So uh, in Saratoga, which the is Gene Harlow's last film, um, this picture was in, you know, the first version of the book, and we just never ever mentioned it because it was after the book came out that someone pointed this out to me, that when you have kidney disease, things like your hands uh, right. tend to be tight. And Jean Harlow always had the most elegant hands in photographs. And look at her hand in this. You know, that's just so not the way she usually was. And just mm -hmm. one of those subtle indications that this thing is taking her over. So her last day at the studio was uh, May 29th, 1937, a Saturday. They were six days a week. And there's always been the photograph that uh, is always called the last photograph I've ever taken. That's shot with Walter Pidgeon. When the book came out 10 years ago, um, Mark and I were introduced to this gentleman named Jim Roop, and his father was Carl Major Roop, who was the script supervisor on Saratoga, oh, wow. on Live of Lady, and uh, knew Gene Harlow really well. Well, he had the a last. photograph from May 29th, 1937. It's never been published. I've been sitting on it for 10 years waiting for the right moment, and this is the right moment. So this side, this is the photograph that we always see. This is the last oh, yeah. one, and it may be, or it's the last published one, but to the right of it is this other photograph that was shot the same day. It's never been published. It's never been seen. This is the first time it's in print. What's interesting about this photograph to me and Mark actually pointed this out, is that Jean Harlow is reaching down to her shoe and sort of adjusting her shoe strap. 
So this day, I mean, at this period of time, her uh, her body was swelling up. Oh yeah. Why she's in, and it's why she's in this gown that has all these layers, kind of kind of hiding her swollen wa uh, waistline. And she said, "Look what she's doing. It's probably her feet swelling up. Mm -hmm. So she's just releasing some of the pressure. So." And maybe it's, it's true, maybe it's not, but you know, it's just an interesting thing to know. Well, the thing is though, too, I think a lot of people, they think it's easier to believe the myths than the truth. But what a lot of people don't realize is medicine was very different back then. My great, great grandmother died of kidney failure at 28. So back then, kidney dialysis and transplants and antibiotics, those did not exist. None yet. of that so existed. if you had a problem like this, you were doomed. I mm -hmm. mean, there is no way to save you. And it's very unusual to have kidney disease at a young age. Great grandma, she, yeah. Yeah. So there are two people. So it, it does happen. It does happen. I mean, that's and, possible. And it's, it's a terrible, terrible thing. It's, it's a terrible way, terrible way to go. One of the things that sort of has come full circle in the story of Jean Harlow is this painting, Farewell to Earth. Get closer. So David Stan first put a black and white picture of Farewell to Earth in his book. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was mentored by him and saw, oh, it's missing. It's been missing for 50 years. We have to find it. But you only have it in black and white. I'm doing a book. I'm going to have it put in color because when someone finds it, they're going to see it in color, not in black and white. I had Victor Mascaro colorize it as best he could, which he did a great job, but we had no reference. It was just, it's a nighttime sky. You do the best you can. So I sent that information out into the universe. Nothing happened until 2016. Uh, our friend, Karen Roberts Frenzel, mm -hmm. who worked at- Rita Hayworth biographer. Yes, you're right. Uh, she works at Bonham's Limited. Mm -hmm. That's what it's called. Uh -huh. And she arrived at a party late. And she said, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm late. We just got this giant 615 Harlem painting in. And uh, uh, you know that's why I'm running late. And I hear there's, some, there's only one six foot Jean Harlow painting. It's got to be Farewell to Earth. So I'm trying to be cool, but I got to get in there <laughs> right away so I can confirm I, I can't sleep. I can't do anything. Right. So God bless Karen because she. She's the best. She uh, let me come in uh, two days later. And the first thing she said was, oh, do you want us to take pictures of you with it? Who does that? Oh, her bosses probably don't want to know that. Anyway, I saw it and it was as vibrant as it was the day it was painted. It was gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. It was the real thing. And I just thought, I'm supposed to rescue this. That's why this fell in my lap before people know publicly. And I did, I did rescue it. So it came back to Hollywood and it will be here forever. Uh, so with this new version of the book, finally, the painting has been found and it's back home. How did it turn up like that? I mean, you, you said it was it wound up at Bonhams, but what was the, did, was it passed along from person to person? Like, was there any kind of a, a story behind it's, how that- It's it? still a little bit sketchy. There are pieces we're never going to know because oh, wow. the people that have it don't have all the story. Oh, okay. So uh, the painting was found in a sort of Victorian type farmhouse place in a little town called Harrisonville, Missouri. It's about 20 miles south of Kansas City. So how it got to Kansas or how it got to Missouri, I don't know. Nobody knows. My guess is that uh, somehow maybe it w went back to the Harlow family. That would make sense. Uh, of which there was Lillian Boyd who lived in Colorado. And from there, maybe it went back to Missouri, or that Lillian passed away and it went to a secondhand store and was purchased by the person who owned this house in Harrisonville. The person who owned the house loved blonde bombshells. Did he know mm. the painting was Gene Harlow? Who we knows? don't have that answer. Yeah. But it was kept in his house. His name uh, was James Idle Jr. It was a family home and he ended up living somewhere else for decades, so that house went into decline. It was literally, literally falling down a, uh, around itself. Someone took the painting, which is uh, seven feet 
two, six feet, seven feet two by five and a half, seven feet two by five feet long. Turned it on its side and stored it behind a hutch in the dining room. And thank God took photographs. Wow. So um, I probably saved it being behind that hutch from that getting is, like light damage or that is or junk falling on it. Yeah, that too. Uh, and that that's where it was found. So uh, the surviving family members who now own the house and all the property, and the woman who uh, was in charge of them um, legally dealing with it all, she's the one who started doing the research because she she realized somebody somebody put this back here to save it. That's and crazy. she found out, oh, this is this is Jean Harlow. This is that missing painting. Wow. So then it gets to Bonham's and Karen Roberts Frenzel, and the rest is history. Happy Hollywood history. And where can people see this painting today if they visit Hollywood? They can't right now because it, it's uh, not on display right now. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, it was on display for three years at the Hollywood Museum in the old Max Factor building. Mm -hmm. And at some point, I'm sure it will be again. It's, that's a very fun museum, by the way. If you haven't been, it's really worth checking out. Yes, yes. The thing that's great about the Hollywood Museum is that the building itself is part of old Hollywood history. The Max Factor Salon is where so many movie stars got their hair color, their makeup. Uh, Jean Harlow, uh, Lucille Ball, uh, Marilyn Monroe all had their hair colored there their makeup perfected there and um, so the building itself is part of history and it is it's a celebration of the golden age of Hollywood plus also current day Hollywood so you can go there and see things that are popular now things from the past it's a really wonderful blend of the both and there's uh, of course a Harlow exhibit still there it's small right now it's uh, about four uh, um, tables full glass table, glass covered tables, I should say, and then one standing one that has a uh, Rex Rabbit first leaves. I have to compliment you because you worked so hard on this exhibition to tie in with her centennial back in 2011. And I was lucky enough to get to go to the opening night yeah. bash for that. And it was so thorough. I mean, you had the Jean Harlow car up. I don't know how you got that giant car up there, but you did. And Max that Factor. was impressive. That was very impressive. Well, you know, the thing is the Max Factor building mm -hmm. was a functioning factory. So it had wow. an elevator in the back that was designed for trucks to be backed into it, go up to the third floor. All of the product was put in uh, the trucks elevator would go back down to the ground floor, drive out, and start driving around the country. And to this day, that elevator is still in use. It's remarkable. Because that was my first thought was, how did he get that car up there on the third floor? That was really amazing. Yeah. So it was the elevator, and then we got it on the third floor. Then you put it on like little shepherd caster type things on the, under the wheels, and then you just start pushing. And we literally would turn it, push, turn, push, go around corners. <laughs> and get it into the place where I would have watched it. a documentary about the making of that exhibit quite frankly because it sounds pretty cool yes it was you know 12 people yelling oh turn this way this way this way <laughs> you know one piece that really stood out for me um, is when I looked at you know you look at her clothes and her car and all the stuff there was one charm bracelet that stood out to me because and I don't know why this hit me the way it did but three of the charms on it one was a pair of crutches one was a dog and one was a whiskey bottle mm -hmm. and i can't explain why maybe but i got very emotional when i saw that oh, and that there's nice something about i mean seeing the big ticket items and the fancy stuff is cool i love that too but sometimes seeing a simple everyday item that you know they wore that had some sort of emotional significance and maybe because i love charm bracelets i don't know but that really kind of got me you know that particular piece well that piece uh, is owned by another Harlow collector named Brian Bundy. And this was one of the great things about doing this exhibit was that I could reach out to all these people that I knew that were incredible collectors and borrow uh, some of their pieces to make this uh, exhibit as successful as it was and as wide ranging as it was. Uh, the charm bracelet is interesting because every single one of those charms means something to exactly her. the exactly. crutch is very specifically she sprained her ankle in 1934 and she was having a um an after sunday afternoon party it couldn't be stopped 
So she's in crutches, but still has the party. So it was photographed and ends up in a movie magazine. So it was sort of a joke with all of them, but a charm comes out of it. It, it meant something in the journey of her life. Yeah. Same thing with the dog. I don't know which dog it is offhand. I'd have to look at the charm to see. Um, and the whiskey bottle, mm, I don't know about that one. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love turbos too. And to me, yeah, they tell a story. They're like a simple yes. piece of jewelry that they're not, it's not like a piece that's so fancy that a normal average woman couldn't own because a charm bros, it's pretty easy to find and afford. But yeah, there's something about a story in each yeah. piece that kind of, I don't know, resonates. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. and it's wonderful that this stuff still exists, that it's been found and you know, and then I had the good fortune to be able to pull all this stuff together and have it shown all together in Hollywood, which was great. And if you ever do that again, I want to make a documentary about putting together the car and getting up to the third floor, putting together things. Because I seriously, that was like an epic, epic exhibit of Harlow's life. I've never seen a better Gene Harlow collection and exhibit come together. That was really excellent. Well, you know, and the great thing uh, in 2016 when we rescued Farewell to Earth. But then it became apparent that, oh, you know, I need to do um, a bigger exhibit. So I went to the owner, Donnell Dadigan, who owns uh, the Hollywood Museum and the historic Max Factor building. I told her about this painting, how important it was, and could we expand the exhibit? And I'm going to need a lot of room. And she gave it to me. And to me, that was the best exhibit of all, because I had the uh, 1932 Ignazia mural. That's I right. had Jean Harlow's Farewell to Earth painting, and I put them together for the first time ever in the same room. And for me, that was really spellbinding. And oh, so here's my little anecdotal story I'm going to share with you. When I was at, uh, you know, like, um, I'm going to say 11 or 12, and I first had discovered Jean Harlow, and, you know, I would see all these photographs in John Cabal books and how beautiful she was. And I just wanted more and more, but, you know, there weren't that many books. There wasn't that much okay. access back then. And I remember I had this dream one night that I was in the basement of like a church and there were all these tables with hundreds and hundreds of Jean Harlow photographs on them. And I'm like, oh my God. So I start looking through the photographs so that I'll remember them and I wake up. So it's like, oh, oh, what were these images I saw? So when I, did this uh, uh, second exhibit and I borrowed so much more from people and I had everything strewn out on these tables as I was uh, curating everything. All of a sudden I flashed on that dream and I went, oh my God, this time it's the same thing. But this time I can look at every single picture all I want. And it was such a, a great full circle thing for me. Wow, that's incredible. Nerd, very nerdy. Well, it's maybe like you saw what your future might hold somehow. Sometimes it seems that way. Well, can we look at some of the memorabilia? We can. Let me just show you Excellent. one last thing in the okay. book because uh, it does have a lot of firsts. Here's another James Doolittle color photograph from 1937. This is from Saratoga. This is a costume that she ended up not wearing in film because she passed away first. I believe the Dutch hat was worn by her stand-in, not her stand-in, I'm sorry, her replacement uh mary d's uh the dress and jacket actually went to her friend bobby brown oh, and wow. bobby wore it until it just wore out so at least it had a, it had a good life yes so get the book comes out mid-october yes and please get it from larry edmund's bookshop in hollywood if you can and i will post the link okay so i'm going to grab some things and we'll just talk okay and i'm going to check the q a and see if what kind of uh, questions are coming idea. in here start with amy sternberg said yes the charm bracelet was her favorite too uh, so wow I'm, I'm not the only one that had that reaction danny miller says the reality show watcher in me wanted daryl to present carrie with that charm bracelet as a gift uh wow not possible but that's a lovely thought danny <laughs> let's see or carrie giving the painting to daryl daryl has the painting uh, let's see um has daryl ever thought of doing a documentary to go with the book uh 
I have thought of doing a documentary. I just need more time in my life. So I'm thinking about it a lot more right now. Um, and since it's, I'm not techie at all, and that's probably the biggest block. I need someone to go, oh, I can do all of that real easy. Just hand me the, the actual you know, scans or the actual photographs and the way it will go. So at some point it's gonna happen. Well, there's so many stories within stories. Like that's one of the things that's fascinating about our conversation because it's not just the story of Harlow, but like the story behind that charm race, like the story behind how the, the painting journey. surfaced, yeah. the story underneath the story. Yeah. That's really oh, so one other thing about the painting, David Sten being my mentor, we talked about that painting a lot. Mm -hmm. And one of the early things that he told me, and then he, he reminded me once it fell on my lap was, do you remember I told you I went to a, a really high-end psychic in New York mm -hmm. back in the early 1990s, and the psychic said, the painting wants to be found. Oh, maybe I never told you this. The painting wants to be found, don't give up. So it took another, whatever it is, I'm gonna say 20 years roughly, but the painting got found. And then uh, when I talked to David on the phone after I told him what had happened, he said, Daryl, that's what, I guess that's why I told you, you're the one who was supposed to find it. Oh, oh, that's fascinating. I have another question. My friend April Clemmer and I are both big jewelry fans. Mm -hmm. And Jean Harlow had this incredible star sapphire ring that William Powell gave her. It was not, I don't think he meant it to be an engagement ring, but that's perhaps how she took it. Do we know what happened to the star sapphire? Uh, David Stan is the one who's done the main research on that, mm -hmm. and he went back to the original jeweler that provided it, and the Star Sapphire was not gem quality. Uh. He chose it for its size. He didn't choose it for its uh, uh, being a perfect sapphire. And so for that reason, it just doesn't have a, a, a strong provenance. Mm, so if okay. it came back to the jeweler, they didn't catalog it. Wherever it went, it's not going to show up because it's a priceless sapphire. It's an anecdotal large sapphire with a story that maybe doesn't mean anything uh, in, in the jewelry world. Okay. I don't know. I know nothing about jewelry, so I can't add my own opinion to it. Okay. So uh, just to start, this is the original 1937 uh, natural color photograph of Jean Harlow by James Doolittle. And on the back of it, I'm just going to read it first. It's cut in half, which is so absurd. Somebody cut the frame down. But it is an April 3rd, 1937 photographic exhibit. So, so I'm probably wasting my time doing this, but this is. This is what research is. You find a little piece and it tells you something. So this, this photograph was in some photographic, photographic exhibition in April 1937. Thank you for falling into my lap. Yes. Uh, you can rarely talk about Jean Harlow without talking about her mother. Uh, her mother was the first, the real Jean Harlow. Uh, the movie star Jean Harlow, her real name was Harlene Carpenter. She didn't want to be a movie star, her mother did. But she had the looks and the youth, and she got the attention. And so um, she did it because her mother was like a manager and pushed her into it. She certainly enjoyed it. She had, she had a great time, but it was her mother's dream. She was, she adored her mother. She was very happy to give this gift to her mother. And so they are very much two peas in a pod. They were uh, enmeshed in a way that ultimately I think is kind of unhealthy uh, where there's not enough separation between the two. And I think in her later years, Jean Harlow tried to break free from her mother's hold. Uh, what's great about this photograph is that they both signed it. Uh, Mother Jean wrote in this really uh, measured, uh, really attractive uh, script. Jean Harlow is much more emotional and hers is more childlike. Her autograph will change depending on what mood she's in. And it's true, right, that Jean Harlow's mother came out to Hollywood early trying to pursue a career of her own. And when that didn't work out, she sort of transferred her ambitions to Jean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So let's see. 
uh, one of the other things that was always a little bit of a puzzle was what happened with Jean Harlow's practical aid for it. So, you know, um, it's always been reported that William Powell paid for it. How much did he willingly pay for it versus being surprised by uh, Mrs. Bellow? Uh, it appears that uh, she announced it in the press before he offered. Surprise, surprise. Uh, it is the kind of thing that Mrs. Bellow would do. And what, just to clarify, Bellow was Jean Harlow's mom. She married a, a, a guy Bello. named Marino Bellow. Yeah. So when yeah. he says Mrs. Bellow, that's her mom. So um, the crypt that Jean Harlow is buried in has three chambers in it. Jean Harlow is in the middle. Her mother is on the top. The third one is still empty. And, you know, the idea at the time was that William Powell would go there. And ultimately, he didn't. Uh, once again, Karen Roberts Frenzel was the person who uh, was the conduit. She contacted me and she said, um, um, I'm in Palm Springs and I'm going to be helping uh, William Powell's estate sell a lot of his stuff. And in it was this uh, 1957 contract addendum. You won't be able to read it, but I'm just going to show you up close. This is for Forest Lawn. And this is uh, basically William Powell saying, Mrs. Bellow is in the top crypt. Jean Harlow's in the middle. I am not going to be in the bottom crypt and no one can ever occupy the bottom crypt. And uh, this is his admittance card into Forest Lawn. And so this answers the question, when was it decided? And you know, Mrs. Bellow died in 1958, 1957. She must have started pestering William Powell. I need mm -hmm. to know, one, that I am definitely going in. Two, are you going in? Because if you aren't, I don't want anyone else there. So I think the genesis of this is really Mrs. Bellow. So it just, just tells me so much. Absolutely. It always makes me sad because I'm such a Harlow fan that when I go to Forest Lawn Glendale, I can't even visit her because they won't allow it. And that makes me sad because I think she would probably love it if we went there today and left her flowers. I think she would love it. Her mother? Not so much. I don't know. You know, I mean, I, I would like to think that she would be pleased, but, you know, supposedly, well, you know, uh, Forest Lawn, uh, the Great Mausoleum has this very schizoid thing where it's a private mausoleum. You can't go in unless you have a family member there. It's all you're paying for the privacy. But then they also have this stained glass window display that's open to the public. So you can't go in. Oh, come on in. There's a stained glass window that you can look at. It's just really silly. Yeah. So some people have found their way into, uh, you know, the Hall of Benediction where Jean Harlow is. And, uh, you know, I'm not recommending it, but people have visited. But it's not open to the public. There you go. Let's see what else can I show you that's interesting. Uh, I mentioned Lillian Boyd, who was uh, on the Harlow side of the family. I'm trying to remember now whether she's one of the, one of Jean Harlow's grandmother's sisters or daughter of. I, I actually don't recall at the moment, but here is a 1936 photograph of Jean Harlow signed to Aunt Lillian. So it's just nice to know that, you know, there was a whole family uh, that Jean Harlow knew and interacted with her whole life. She wasn't just alone in Hollywood. And it says kindly credit Ted Allen on the back there. Oh, so wow. that is Ted not a Harrell photo. Ted Allen. Yes. You know, in 1935, when Jean Harlow went through a whole image transformation, uh, rather than being a platinum blonde, uh, excuse me, a platinum blonde, she switched over and became a honey blonde, much closer to her original hair color. There was also the idea that she would stop being this hard uh, sort of working woman and become, give her more options for the future, a much more ladylike version. And that's what all of these photographs represent. And Ted Allen uh, was brought on because he could really uh, sort of demonstrate the warmth of her per personality rather than how sexy she was. And remaking a star's image was a big deal at a studio. I mean, I'm sure that's something they poured a lot of resources and thought into. Yeah, you know, and amazingly enough, um, 
she was more popular with women than men. So this is something that I got from, oh, well, they're gone now, um, Profiles in History, a really, really long time ago. Nobody bid against me, which thank you, everyone, for not bidding against me. This <laughs> is a 1936 photograph from Live of Lady, and it's the main cast with the director. And each one of the uh, people uh, in the photograph has signed a uh, picture to George with some sort of in-joke. In so who is George? George is probably the screenwriter, George Oppenheimer. So just a really wonderful piece. I wish it was in the book, but it's not. Was it hard to decide what to put in the book and what not? Because yes, I imagine yes, it absolutely. Would. And you know what I have to say, Mark Vieira was brilliant at this because he had already done 10 or 12 books when the idea of this book came along. And um, he just did this thing that was so smart, and he did it because he knew. We already know this book is going to be around 240 pages. So we're going to have, whatever, 12 chapters, and we need to tell her story in, whatever it is, 240 plates. So just like a movie, just like a comic strip, you tell the story and you never repeat yourself. If you showed, oh, these two pictures are both beautiful, so I'm going to put them in, but they're similar, you're going to bore your audience. That makes perfect sense. So this was this was the hard part was, okay, we know what the chapters are. This will tell her story. Now we have to choose uh, probably no more than 12 pictures per chapter. What's the big picture that sells the chapter? Then smaller pictures, next page, smaller pictures. When you end the chapter, big picture that finishes the story for that chapter. It was really a fascinating education. Wow, kind of a punctuation mark at the end of the sentence. Every single chapter ends with a large picture. Big picture opening, large picture ending. Wow. And it was hard because, you know, oh, I have wow. a million pictures I love and I, you know, okay, I can't bore the audience. I can't use this picture. But it's hard. I know how that is. And yeah. it's like just because like if we're fascinated by it, that doesn't mean everybody else is. And it's hard to think right. about it that way. Yeah. It truly Which is. is why you never repeat. You tell the next story, the next story that gets you to the end. So it's just like making a movie. Yeah, very similar. Okay, what else can I show you? This is a very sweet. Oh, well, I'll show it to you. Uh, this is a Hell's Angels time period autograph picture. And the great thing about it is that I already <laughs> typed out what it says on the back. So uh, she must have been sick when she was traveling, touring at the time, and uh, a nurse named, uh, whose nickname was Little Pint, looked after her. And so Jean Harlow has written on it, to my half pint, I'm always tempted to get sick again so I can have you around. Lots of love, just yours, Jean Harlow. Aww. Can you show them the back with the date and the handwriting on there too? Yes, you know what? I love looking what's at great. details. Like well, because this is who it was sent to. So show it without the reflection. I'm sure it's backwards, but anyway, what was great was the information is on the back of the photograph, who the person is, where it's going to, and then the typed information. And you know, such a great picture. Wow. Beautiful. I could just stare at these for hours, yeah. honestly. They're so beautiful. Um, this is one of the things that showed up on eBay once. Okay. In 1937, uh, MGM was um, had an exhibitor's um, week where all of these people that um, provide the movies for every single town in the United States and Canada would amass at MGM for a week and they would be taken through here are all the films that are coming out this next year that you are going to be selling uh, we're going to have a luncheon with all the movie stars at MGM and uh, there'll be parties and all kinds of stuff so this is the program for the luncheon oh. on May 2nd 1937 with a picture of Jeanette McDonald on the front from uh, 1937's The Firefly this would have been given to every every single one of the exhibitors. And on the inside, it has the menu for the day. So I can do this without ripping it. 
uh, along with the program of what's going to happen. And I'm just going to read it. Uh, what stands out to me is um, number six says, today is a starlet. Tomorrow, one of uh, the greatest personalities of the screen. And it's a young performer that just has started at MGM named Judy Garland and her Clark Gable chorus, oh which gosh. means you know what song they sing. You made me love you. Exactly. Wow. Uh, it opens up and there's a place for autographs. That opens up and becomes a map of the main lot, which I'm gonna try and do without ripping anything. How can I help you? I don't yes, want it to please. land in the yes. shrimp here. You know, so uh, you could wander around the lot and figure out where you were going. Or, oh, if I go to stage 22, maybe I can see Clark Gable and Gene Harlow filming Saratoga. Oh, wow. Which is written right on the thing. And so I bought this on eBay. And what's great is that it was autographed. By Gene. Gene Harlow, Una Merkel. Una Merkel, Clark Gable, oh. Jeanette McDonald. Wow. That was a perk. I love the sheet music in the center. It says, yeah. Roar, Leo, Roar. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Anyway, so just a great piece of MGM memorabilia. So, uh, how are we doing on time? Yeah, I think we're doing well. Uh, let's see if people are asking us oh, some yes, more questions. Oh, yes, that's a good idea. Let's see. Grab a couple of other things. Danny Miller says, wow, these color photos are extraordinary. I agree. Hey, Monique uh, wants to know how Tukey's doing. Tukey, I have to tell you, Tukey's doing really well. Tukey is his dog who looks just like a teddy bear. It's the cutest dog ever. She's sleeping right now, so I'm not going to bother her. But Tukey is almost 15. She is a chow corgi mix. And um, she has a, a growth under her arm. It's not, not cancerous, but it, it has been affecting her mobility. So I just felt like, I bet she's under some kind of chronic pain mm. that said, don't do surgery. She's just too old. It's wrapped around, you know, tendons and things. So it's just not going to end well. So um, she's on, to, on an anti-inflammatory, but then I also put her on CBD oil. Mm -hmm. And it's been about six months now. And I have to say, she is just really perked up. She walks with Aww. a trot now. She's happy. She's attentive. She's playful. So do it for your aging dogs. It, it just has made a huge, huge difference. This is a very special thing, which is not going to show up very well at all. Darn it. Ugh. I can always take a picture and post <laughs> That's it. That's what we'll have to do. Social media. Okay. So uh, when Gene Harlow went back east in at the end of 1931 and into 1932, one of the things that she did was she had these uh, profile sculptures made of her by uh, a sculptor named Adam Peets. There were two large ones made, one that her mother kept, one her father kept, went to her father's side of the family. Um, then there were smaller ones made, and when she passed away in 1937, Adam Peets had really small ones about the size of a quarter made. Those are all over the place. Adam Peets kept one for himself. This is a bronze medallion, and this is actually his very own medallion. It has her portrait on it, and when we post a picture, then you'll see it's, it's very beautiful. If we took it out of the plastic, it might not have some It's letter, sealed. But... Oh, it's sealed. Oh, shoot. Okay. I haven't done that. Uh, so that exhibitor's luncheon, mm -hmm. everybody was given one of these MGM family, uh, Lion family uh, paperweights. And uh, so they're bronze. And um, this is about the third one that I've ever found. Oh, wow. So they're out there. If you, if you go on eBay, there's one for sale on eBay right now, but... It's for way too much money. Don't spend that amount of money on it. Let me see if any more questions are popping up. Yeah. Does Dara own any of Jean's dresses? Uh, that's from Marie Hankins. I do not. You know, her clothing 
is something that is the rarest of the rare. Uh, it does not seem to have survived. Um, the one thing that I own, which came from Brian Bundy, are her Rex Rabbit fur sleeves. And she got those, I think, in 1931 and most notably wore them um, in December 1933 at the Hal Roach 20th anniversary uh, producer's party that he had. So there are tons of photographs of her with it, and those are on display at the Hollywood Museum. Excellent. Sandra Lawson says Jean looked very happy in her photos with her dog, Oscar. They both sparkled. Oscar was her favorite dog. She oh. got him in August 1932, and he survived her, and he was lost without her. Did Mama Jean take the dog? Mother Jean. It's never Mama Jean. Mama oh, Jean. Mother Jean. Yes, Mama Jean is an Irving Shulman construction okay. based on Mama Rose from ah, Gypsy. Gypsy. Okay. Stage mother. It was his shorthand for you to understand who this woman was. Okay. Her name was Mother Jean. She was okay. never called Mama in her lifetime. I stand corrected. So did that's my one of my missions in life to stamp up that stupid Mama Jean thing. Yes. Did Mother Jean take the dog, Harlow's dog? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, let's see here. Do any of Jean's costumes exist? Now, doesn't Greg Schreiner have the bombshell duster that she wears by no, Adrian? No. Or is no. that a recreation? That's a recreation. Okay. Um, and it's not Greg Schreiner, it's Brian Bundy. Uh, oh, okay. The only okay. costumes that we know of uh, very definitely are at uh, the Fashion Institute in downtown Los Angeles. Okay. Uh, one of her bombshell gowns still exists. And then her periwinkle blue dance shorts from Reckless in 1935 still exist. So every once in a while, uh, when they do their Oscar nominated costumes annually, they will bring up these costumes and also have them on display. And by the way, the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising in downtown LA, they do an Oscar costume exhibit, an Emmy costume exhibit, which I just went to, and it's totally free. So I, their website's great. I'll post it on the hollywoodkitchenshow.com website, but it's always worth checking out. Yeah, that's great. So uh, when you were a movie star in the 1930s, mm -hmm. yeah, you often got uh, merchandising with your name attached to it. So in the around 1932, there is Jean Harlow perfume and it was advertised through uh, movie magazines, which sounds like it doesn't make it very high end. <laughs> Well, I have a question for you about that because, you know, in doing research, I'm always going through classic movie magazines yeah. and you see stars endorsing a ton of products, you name it, from mm -hmm. perfume to beauty products to food to cars to... Now, were these tied in with the studio or would, were these stars being paid a specific amount of money to lend their names to this product? Was, How did that work? It was all through the studio. I figured. Okay. Always through the studio and... Uh, Gene Harlow had uh, an agent in the studio who his job was to manage all of those contracts, make those okay. deals happen. And that's Dick Orsati, one of the okay. two Orsati brothers. Uh, so, uh, you know, when she advertised uh, Max Factor mm -hmm. uh, makeup, uh, any kind of hair products, there would be contracts signed for every single thing and photographs taken. And was she paid anything for that stuff? I don't have that answer. I don't either. I've always wondered about that because, again, some stars you see a lot more frequently on those kind of ads and some you don't. So I've always kind of wondered, like, economically, were they getting anything out of their face and likeness being yeah. used? That, I, I don't have that answer. Maybe somebody who's watching this will have an answer. I do know that in 1937, uh, she was she advertised Dodge cars and was gifted a Dodge car. So they're had to i mean to me that means that there was some reciprocity kind of reciprocity is the right word for it thank you yes so chances are there was product always available okay i can smell this today uh you bet you can so this perfume there's still a half a bottle left oh wow and this is old world perfume this is not like cologne that our generation grew up with this is really uh concentrated and pungent and the idea with this perfume is that it will smell different on every single person who puts on puts it on. Uh, and Cora Sue Collins, once again, showed me the correct way that you do this so that you don't uh, 
do anything with the actual liquid. You take a Kleenex and dab it on the top. Okay. And that's how you apply it to your oh, skin. Okay. You never, ever touch the actual perfume in the bottle. Okay. So when you put it on, it's going to smell different because it's going to interact with your own body smells than when someone else puts it on. I may regret asking this, but I'm going to anyway. Um, presumably, this is from the 30s, so ergo about 90 years old. Right? Mm -hmm. If you and I were to get a Kleenex right now and dab this and put it on our bodies, are we going to poison our, or hurt ourselves? Or is right. it probably going to be okay? It will just smell really, really strongly like perfume all day. Uh, other people have done it in the last two years. They're still living. That's good to know. So I think that it's okay. Once again, I know nothing about perfume. So I hmm. don't know if it goes off or whether it is fine for decades and decades and decades. Hmm. Would you like to give it a try? Um, I think I'm going to sit this one out for the moment. <laughs> But thank you. I do love the box, though. Look at the uh, the ribbon lining, yeah. this thick ribbon kind of stuff that's in the bottom of the box, and it's really nice. And smell, it's really concentrated. It's really, it's really strong. Mm -hmm. It's super strong. But you know, that was the idea back then: was that you didn't spray it on, you didn't put it all over, you put it on on a Kleenex or on a handkerchief, and you dabbed. Because a little goes a long way. I was just about to use that phrase because I love perfumes and I do have a ton of them, but you don't want to ever wear something that enters the room before you do and then leaves it long after you do because then it's kind of yes. you know, very overpowering. Another way to describe this is this is old lady perfume. I that's I didn't want to say that, but the room no longer smells like shrimp. I mean this is I'll true. Say that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. This is this is the uh, the way old ladies smelled 40 years ago, where you go, oh, what's that? Yeah. It's this old perfume, and maybe they Which used to I love old much. ladies, don't get me wrong, but it's just the scent is very, very, very overpowering. Yes. And I kind of tend to like things a little more subtle. Yeah. Okay, what have we here? Oh, so um, I have two binders with the most important Harlow stuff. So if my house is on fire, I grab the binders, grab my dog, out I go. As so, it should be. Not necessarily in that order, but so um, a lot of these things are personal family things. So I'm just going to start pulling things out. This is um, part of Montclair Carpenter, her father's estate. Uh, this is a picture of him when he was young with his mother, Diana Beale Carpenter. And this all came up through heritage auctions, I'm going to say about 10 years ago. Oh, wow. And um, it all was found in the attic of a home in the, quote, somewhere in the Midwest, which they could not tell me because of the privacy of uh, the auction house. Mm. Uh, but I know what town he died in, so I, I can kind of figure it out. Um, all these things belong to Montclair Carpenter, his own personal photographs of Jean Harlow. That was her dad. This was her dad. And the mom wouldn't let her see the dad, correct? Once they got a divorce. Yes, her mother was, was, was really hostile and angry and actually ripped all the picture. He, she ripped off all the heads of the pictures of him uh, that she retained. So one of those oh. is actually in Harlow and Hollywood. So what's nice about this is that it has Harleen written on the back, not Jean Harlow. Harleen, that's her real name. Why was she so bitter and angry toward him? Because it was a sort of a marriage she was forced into, or they genuinely Pretty just much. went? It was a marriage that she was forced into. She was um, uh, somebody who she, was sort of like born in the wrong time. She should have been that. born 80 years later when she could be a working woman. She could. She is somebody who uh, wanted to experience the world, and she would have made a great manager. So she was a great stage mother. She was a great manager of someone's life. She would have really excelled in that. And in another time, she absolutely would have had that opportunity. Yes. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, she came from a family that was upwardly mobile. And her father uh, was middle class, pushing upper middle class. He wanted his daughter to do well, to do well for him. Mm, okay. He and his daughter are kind of cut from the same cloth. I get Very you. willful. Okay. Their entire life was this. Um, 
So she ends up marrying this mild mannered mild mannered dentist. Very nice man. They don't have, they don't have the same personality makeup at all. So in the journey of their marriage, she is bored to death, bursting to get out. Um, and ultimately it ends in divorce in 1922. She's really angry. She does end up with sole custody of her daughter because she would have it no other way. Mm -hmm. uh, that sounds so very at her. Yeah, and it's unfortunate for the daughter because she stayed yeah. in touch with her father, but she had to sneak visiting him. And it sounds like she continued to date or marry men that were like a search for the father. Jean Harlow? Yeah. Would you say that or uh, is yes. that? Yes, I think if you look at pictures of uh, the key men in her life, they all look the same and they all look like her father. I think what's true about her is that she was always looking for a protector. That much, I, I think, is the key to who she is as a person and a key to who she wanted to marry and did marry. And they all, the thing they all have in common, except for her first husband, was that they were protectors for her. What was she seeking protection from? That's another question. Definitely. Uh, this, I think, is a really, this, this is the thing that moves me. Uh, this is um, a letter that's written on both sides by Montclair Carpenter. And so um, in the old days, when you wrote a letter to someone, you might uh, you know, write it out first so that you've got a copy and you have figured out what you're going to say. So that's obviously what Dr. Carpenter did with this. He wrote a letter to Marino Bello when Jean Harlow died. And then on the flip side of this, he wrote a letter to Howard Strickland, who was the head of publicity at MGM when Jean Harlow died, thanking Howard Strickland for what he did to look after his daughter while he was at, while she was at MGM. Same thing with Marino Bello. You know, and uh, Marino Bello is such a scoundrel, but, you know, Dr. Carpenter is just so appreciative of him uh, in this letter. And to me, this... This tells me who this man is. Can you read this to us? Uh, if I had glasses, I could. I'll do my best with our glasses. Uh, Mr. Bellow, you were so very kind and thoughtful on my behalf during the trying days of our great sorrow. Oh, that's going to make me cry. That I wish to thank you again. Especially, I'm grateful to you for telephoning me so promptly. And I believe you were sincerely devoted to my little daughter. The, it's just so sweet you know this is who he was this is just remarkable and for that i respect you and wish you well sincerely yours and then you're a copy so you know i feel a real affinity with with montclair and when we first started the book and we didn't have a publisher and we could not find a publisher because the publishing was in the dumps in 1990 in 20 08, 09, uh, 2010, it just was horrific. So I would go to Forest Lawn to recruit the Heather, and I'd go in the back and I would ask for Mont's, Montclair's help. So I felt like he was on our side. Yes. Uh, so, you know, it's just, it's just a very, very, it's one of my uh, most treasured things. Well, I want to ask you another question because, you know, again, looking at, these things is so profoundly and emotionally moving and personal to see the handwriting, to see the actual documents. There has been an interstitial that I'm sure a lot of my fellow TCM friends have seen on Turner Classic Movies about a recent letter that surfaced from Jean Harlow to William Powell. And can you talk about that for us? Uh, this is another collector. I don't own the letter. Um, it's a, a, a wonderful lady named Marnay Rafter. And I don't remember the time frame now. Uh, I don't remember how many years ago it was that she found it. Uh, but it came from Jean Harlow's maid's estate. Her name was Blanche Williams. Mm -hmm. The letter is only about this big. And um, it doesn't have Jean Harlow's name on it. It doesn't say who it's to. It says Poppy. Anybody who knows a lot about Jean Harlow knows that Jean Harlow's nickname for William Powell was Poppy. So when she saw it, she knew what it was, and the person who owned it didn't really know. 
So, uh, uh, so she acquired it and she showed it to me. And I'm like, oh my God, this, when you read it, it is so specific over and over and over about the content in the letter. There's no way that it's not Jean Harlow who's written it. And it was written in October of 1936. And so I shared it with David Stan. He could not get over it. He just was like, can I, can I do something with this? I want to do uh, some, something with Turner Classic Movies. And I got Marnie's permission. And so I'm sure everyone has seen uh, this little mini documentary called Letters to Hollywood that's on Turner Classic Movies and, and still plays periodically, which is really, really wonderful. The letter is going to be in the updated edition of Harlow and Hollywood. So everyone will have their own copy of it, and flipping to the pages I'm talking, uh, so that you can read it to yourself. And it's, uh, it's just one of the coups of this book. It's, it's basically life size. Uh, the thing that's most poignant about the letter that David Stanton also points out is that she references not feeling well. You know, I wish I felt like my old self. Uh, and what she doesn't know is that it's one of the harbingers of uh, her immune system breaking down because of kidney, uh, kidney disease. So it's so much more tragic than it seems. It's just being blown off here lightly. Well, she didn't know. She didn't know. And medicine, again, it wasn't what it is today. I, mean, I love reading about medical history, too, because the knowledge we have today, while not perfect, is so much greater than what they could have possibly imagined in their wildest dreams back then. Yes. Yeah. So let's see if there's anything else here that's fascinating. All of it. All of it, <laughs> yes. Um, we here to like midnight tonight, just well, going over the stuff. This is a letter that... Uh, William Powell wrote to Montclair Carpenter in 1953. Uh, William Powell had an admittance card to uh, the Great Mausoleum. So my understanding is that you needed an admittance card because it was closed to the public. And uh, Gene Harlow's father, Montclair, maybe he lost his or, or it got uh, misplaced or it was only for a period of time. So he tried to contact his ex-wife to get a new one, got no response. So he writes to William Powell, can you get me an admittance card at Forest Lawn? And that's what this letter is from 1953. And William Powell says, of course I will. So funny how the world worked back then. You would think it was like, you're, you're the father, of course you can go. Not so not, simple. Not so simple. So thank God all this stuff was kept. Thank God it all ended up in the attic of that home. And that that's I was a miracle. It's like yeah. a film history miracle, yeah. basically. Uh, those Adam Peets medallions, this is really small. But like, so this is one of the two that are kind of like uh, life size. And this was taken on April 14th, 1965. Thank you for writing on the back of this stuff. I love when people do that. Same. Uh, you know, in his family's possession. So we are getting some questions. Um, oh, yes. Catherine Bird is asking, what is the very first Harlow collectible you ever found? The very first one was an autograph. I wonder, I think I actually have it in a different binder. Give me two seconds. Hang on, Catherine. We are going to find that the answer to that question quite literally for you. I think it's right here. Uh, it, it was a movie memorabilia show in Pasadena. And it was an autograph from an autograph album. And it was to Ray or Roy. And it was $500. Like, oh my God, oh my God, it's the real thing. I'm going to do it. I'm just going to do it. And it was the first one I ever bought. Wow. And of course, now I can't find it. But I do still have it. And so it has sentimental sentimental value because it's the first one while we're talking about hopefully it'll show well up. people are based on the comments i'm seeing people are so stunned and touched by these letters they are you know the montclair one as you can see just made me really emotional 
So, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's amazing to be able to touch the real experience of the people that are part of that story. Oh, yeah. It was real, you know, this man lost his daughter and the way he writes it is so dignified, you know, in the time of our sorrow. I, I feel you too, because sometimes if I see something like that, I have a very vivid imagination. Like I can envision him writing it. I can yes. envision him crying while he writes. Like I can feel that. Here it is. This oh, is the wow. first the one I first ever, ever collectible Daryl ever ever yeah. acquired. That's it. Bill Graff is saying, "I'm just a few miles from Daryl, and I can smell the perfume from here." <laughs> uh, uh, my apologies for that. My nasal passages are going to be fried for the foreseeable future, but that's okay. <laughs> it's okay. It was well worth that risk. What else can I find here? Oh, here's. Oh, Catherine Burr has another really good question. Mm -hmm. Why weren't there any kiss and tell stories about Jane from ex husbands or lovers? Because a lot of times, of course, you see these tell all those people, right? Yeah. And Rossum didn't. Well, Burn, obviously, for obvious no reasons, one. wasn't able to, but. Nobody did it back in the 1930s. That was just considered vulgar. That's true. It isn't until the 1950s with that horrible. Um, no, 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 no. The the movie magazine pseudo Confidential. exactly. Okay, yeah. that's when it started. When um, you know this company that ran that magazine started digging underneath what the studios told about their stars and started mm -hmm. revealing what the real stories were. Okay, and that you know became like a cancer that just sort of spread spread over the decades. So now TMZ and you know we have to know everything mythology doesn't exist it can survive but you know you get raked over the coals and harold rawson i've always heard for the rest of his life would never talk about harlem he never would you know another classy gentleman but he also worked for mgm he was a company mm -hmm. man oh yeah for a very long time but you know I, to me i think it's really that he was a gentleman and you do not speak publicly about private relationship exactly. i was really good friends with mary carlisle who was a b-movie actress uh, by her own definition. Uh, and I was really, really good friends with her for seven years. And I got to know her really well. And she just made it really clear to me that there were sort of like three avenues. There was her public life that anybody had uh, access to. There was her personal public life, which is uh, Mary Carlisle, the movie star in her personal life, okay, the public has access to that. But then there's her personal, personal life, and that's nobody's business. She never spoke publicly about it. She never spoke about her friends. Everybody in Hollywood knew, Mary will never tell your secrets. So while she could have spilled the beans, it was never going to happen. And that's the way it was back in the 30s. You know, if you had any class, you didn't talk publicly about your private life. Jean Harlow never talked about her real private life. And even in interviews, there's one in Film Fun magazine. Tookie's joining us. Tukes, um, where um, the interviewer asks, is asking questions, and at one point asks a question, and she said, Oh, that's too personal. Ms. Tookie, so you want to come and say hello? Tookie, you want to say hello to everybody watching? Oh, eight's being picked up, so this won't last long. Oh, hi, Tookie. Hi, sweetheart. She's very sweet. Chow Corgi Mix. <laughs> and she's a kisser. Miss Tukey. But I think back then they had a sense of mystery about them. Today, you know so much about the stars, especially with the tabloids, with social media. Yeah. I think Cheney, Lon Cheney, and Greta Garber were kind of onto something because they were so reticent to do publicity. And I think that gave a sense of mystery in this. Kind of air of mystery and fascination that yeah. you don't see in stars today because they let it all hang out and i personally like it when i don't know everything about the star when there's kind of this wall i think that's kind of fascinating myself well and i find it really fascinating that you know in the old days you know stars uh were created by a studio system and you know the studio system crumbled and was replaced by people being their own uh, private contractors. And they can control their own publicity, except for the world of TMZ. 
and um, what happened in the 1970s when there was sort of a uh, this sort of education of cinema um, that it was something viable to really know the history of and the you know the creativity of it. Um, there was a sort of pulling back the curtain of the golden age of Hollywood. And you could now look at the truth underneath the myth and see who these people were that were elevated to stardom. And it didn't hurt them at all. But for the people of that generation, that is the last thing that they would ever want to do. Howard Strickland, who was the head of MGM, who created all those myths, he took that with him. He burned so much of stuff of the stuff that he had created because that was his life's work. And he didn't live in the world where it was possible to tell the truth underneath the myth and that it would still survive. Wow. That's how it plays in my mind. That's really fascinating. So one of the rarest things that you can ever find are um, invitations to Gene Harlow's funeral. Oh, wow. The Academy has one. There's one to Jimmy Starr, who was a, a journalist. And then this one, this is to Lou Roberts. And who is Lou Roberts? So Lou Roberts uh, was a behind the scenes man at MGM and he worked on Saratoga. And his family, who I got this from, didn't even know he worked at MGM. They only knew that he worked at 20th Century Fox. And they said, well, we have this picture of him with this lady with blonde hair. And they sent it to me. And I knew exactly what this was and I knew who it was. I can just show this without a reflection. It's Una Merkel. And she's dressed in the costume from Saratoga. And I was like, that's all I need to know. That's why he's invited. Wow. He worked on Saratoga. He also worked on Red Dust. So she knew him at the studio. And you know what's great? is this means that her mother knew that she was close to these people. Yeah. So because of publicists and her mother, these people, her MGM family, were invited to the funeral. And I've always heard that Jean was very beloved by the crews. She didn't have pretension. She didn't have an attitude. She didn't treat them like the help. Like right. She really cared about their well-being and was very beloved by them. Yes. Yeah. That's and that true. doesn't always happen, believe me. Yeah. Pretty rare. People are still happy about seeing Tuki, by the way. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Just uh, let you know. Tuki is <laughs> almost 15 in November. She's 15. It's remarkable. She's doing so well. I'm so glad to hear that. So am I, because six, eight months ago, she was not doing that well. Hey, look, it's one of Jean Harlow's checks. Oh, wow. This is the only, only the second one I've ever seen in existence. Let's see if I can get a better reflection. And how much is it for? 550 oh 2750 27 dollars 50 cents oh, 27 $2, hey that's much better 550 dollars in deductions hmm. what are those deductions look for well i think i know exactly what it is in 1933 when she went on suspension and there was no mm. money coming in mrs bello and marino bello still needed money so they took a $20,000 second mortgage out on the Beverly Glen property. And so it was agreed she would pay back $550 every week till that thing was paid off. It sounds, it's so sad. It sounds like her mother and her stepfather, Marina Bella, just really took her for a ride. They didn't work and they just kind of lived off. They, they lived off her, you know, Mrs. Bella saw herself as the manager. Marino was investing. Which William Powell proved that was a, a uh, scam. Kind of a scam. And um, between uh, on August 19th, the Time Magazine article came out that said, uh, you know, that described her parents and described Marino Bello as the mysterious Marino Bello who was either going to or coming from investing in mines. And it just was so unclear to William Powell that even this journalist couldn't find out what was going on. So he sent a thin man, a detective down to Mexico to find out what was going on. And there weren't mines, there were other things going on. And so by uh, four weeks later, Mrs. Bella divorces him. Wow. 
it's that fast wow. because he had taken her money and not done what he, what he agreed to do with it. If he's under my feet mm. here under the table. Yes. <laughs> so scoundrel. Yes. Through and through. Yeah. Oh, uh, what else can I show you? Here's a letter to Motion Picture Magazine, which was actually printed in the magazine in 1935. And it's on her 1934 butterfly letterhead. So I think this was probably written on February 14th, 1934, because they all seem to have happened that day. So this okay. is one of them. It's very art deco looking. I don't know. To my motion picture fans, Thanks so much for remembering me in such a thoughtful way. It is no way to start. That must mean reference, some reference to the article that's being written. Uh, I will always think so much of you for what you have done for me. All my love, Jean Harlow. That's awesome. Pretty cool. Yeah, the Play magazines were so important in shaping a star's image and gauging their popularity with the public. Yes. It, it, to me, it makes perfect sense that Krista Lawler and I found so many Harlow recipes because yeah, it just shows how popular she was that Jean Harlow entertains, Jean Harlow at home, mm -hmm. what Jean Harlow's making, what Jean Harlow's doing. It's, it's ubiquitous. Yeah, you know, and it's a lot like the way we experienced television when we grew up. There were three or four stations, and that was it. Mm -hmm. And then whether it was in the 1970s or 1980s, all of a sudden cable comes along and there's a handful more options. And now, does anyone in this current generation watch television? They watch Pretty YouTube, good. they do yeah. everything else. Television, uh, you know, information is, is disseminated in so many more ways now than it was in our time. Back then, movie stars, the information was disseminated through movie magazines. It's true. So uh, here's my holy grail that I'm looking for. This is Stanley Brown, and he was a British man who worked in Chicago. Um, I forget what his career was, but he was very much like Montclair Carpenter, a very mild-mannered gentleman. And he was a fan of Gene Harlow's very early on. And for some reason, she clicked with him and they became friends and so uh they wrote together they wrote to each other uh for her entire life she called him her safety valve so she entrusted him with information that she would not normally share with other people so there were a lot of letters that were just sort of superficial there, there were some that were incredibly personal when she passed away he took all of her letters and he went to the newspapers and had a bunch of them uh, published. The ones that were personal, no, but the ones that just showed who she was as a person were all published in newspapers, which is what I got access to uh, when I was doing the book. So all of a sudden I had all this information that I'd never seen before and we could slot it into the chapters and it just really informed me once again who this person really was. It's just... It breaks my heart, but it's kind of nice that she had a person in her life that she called her safety valve. Yeah. That's kind of a, a major thing to think about. You know, that is your nickname from somebody. Well, you know, she lived in a world where you didn't talk about your personal life. Yeah. She didn't have girlfriends that she talked to. She talked to her mother. That was it. You know, and she had a lot of stuff that needed to be emotionally processed that probably never did. And I'm sure they didn't have therapy where she could go talk about what's going on at the studio or what's happening with her situation with Paul Byrne. I mean, there probably exactly. was nowhere to turn. Nowhere Absolutely to not. To. No, the solution was you shut the door and you didn't talk about it. That was how you dealt with tragedy. Uh, so, you know, um, where are these letters? Did he burn them when he was elderly so that her secrets would always be kept? Are they somewhere? I've never found them. Dave Sten hasn't found them. Some other people are now becoming curious. Wow. So other people are going to do some searching. I would love for this stuff to emerge. Hope springs eternal. If uh, Farewell to Earth can turn up. Mm -hmm. Hey, what else? You can never turn say up? never. Never say never. Exactly. Any more questions? 
I think we've got uh, Leslie Apple saying, this is my most favorite episode of Hollywood Kitchen ever. I love seeing Daryl's collection. Uh, I do too. I've got so many more Harlow recipes. So we're going to have to like do, it again. do more of this. Absolutely. Okay. okay. So I'm going to finish yes. with one last thing, which okay. is another really wonderful piece that I've been looking for for years. Something from Blanche Williams. Oh, for yeah. So this is a letter that Jean wrote to Blanche, probably just at the end of the day, real quick. And then she's out the okay. door. Blanche, I have left the pictures here for George. Thanks, Jean. Who's George? And what pictures? Maybe someday I'll know more, but you know, it's, just, it's the real thing. It's great. Another little piece of a puzzle. I always see people's lives like puzzles. Oh yeah. And how many pieces of the puzzle do you need to get a sense of what the big picture is? Absolutely. Then there's always other pieces that are going to show up. But I, I feel like in the world of Gene Harlow, I have the full outer edges. So I know who this person is and all the colors, all the pieces just add more to it. But because I know who she, how she started, I know her character. I'm never surprised by anything that uh, comes along. Well, thank you so much for sharing this incredible collection with me and with the Hollywood Kitchen viewers. Thank you for the exhaustive research you have done for a lifetime, really, yes. on Jean Harlow. And we're going to do more of these because this has been, There's I'm still, glued to the chair still more here. To show. There is still more to show. And thank you so much to Breakfast at Dominique's for sending he and I these incredible Jean Harlow coffees. And thank you to all of you for watching, for commenting, for participating. I'm so incredibly grateful. I do have a Patreon page if anybody wants to contribute. Funds are always used to help the show and buy ingredients and equipment. The book is for sale at Larry Edmonds, and I'm going to post a link for them where you can order it. From Amazon. And it's on Amazon as well. But if you can support Larry Edmonds, that's always first and foremost. What always. We and... The thing with Larry Edmonds is you're going to get an autographed copy. If okay. you want it autographed personalized to you, uh, uh, he will take the information and that's what you will get. It's up. Um, it will also be in Barnes and Noble and I don't know what other bookstores, uh, but it's going to be out there. And where, if people want to follow you and get updates on Harlow every day and on the book, where can they find you on social media? Uh, I have a Facebook page called Harlow in Hollywood. Please uh, join it. I also have an Instagram page now called Jean Harlow Essential. And I post every single day something that I find interesting. And, um, you know, I'm not somebody who really pays attention to numbers on Instagram. I, I don't care how many likes. But I did this very specifically for the new version of the book. And so everything is very specifically telling you something that I have just sort of uncovered or, oh, look at this, this caricature by uh, um, Al Hirschfeld. I know what photograph this was taken from. So I will post the two images together. It's just anecdotal things like that. Um, so Jean Harlow Essential, that's the other way that you can follow me and, and learn more about Jean Harlow. Excellent. And I will post this soon on hollywoodkitchenshow.com and on the YouTube channel. And thank you. Thank you, Daryl Rooney. You've been a wonderful guest. Thank you. And You're thank you to all of you for watching. And please keep tuning in for more food, fun, and film history from Hollywood Kitchen. There she is. I will drink to that. Ah, uh, cheers. And then we freeze frame just like this. Oh, I just spilled coffee. <laughs> <on>. <laughs> Shoot.